Any person admired for courage, nobility, or exploits, especially in war. Any person admired for qualities or achievements, and regarded as an ideal or model. They rise to the occasion. They meet the challenge. They inspire us. They are heroes. Roger H.C. Donlan, born January 1934 in Saugerties, New York. Roger Donlan was the nation's first recipient of the Medal of Honor for actions taken in Vietnam on July 6, 1964. Colonel Roger Donlan retired from the United States Army in January of 1989 after serving 32 years. He and his wife, Norma, now live in Kansas. He has five children. Roger Donlan volunteered to serve in Vietnam in the early years of United States involvement there. This was Vietnam in the fall of 1963. The war in Vietnam has literally become a fight on two fronts. On one hand, the government faces the Viet Cong communists, and on the other hand, it faces a revolt of the Buddhist majority, a fight which has been joined by thousands of students. The capital, Saigon, is an armed camp. Press conferences seem to be the order of the day. The military governor of Saigon, Tan Thad Dinh, called one to hold foreign interventionists responsible for the riots. Just who, he didn't say. Aid to Vietnam by the U.S. has added up to $3 billion and 14,000 men. Men who are called advisors, but who are in the thick of the battles against the Viet Cong Reds. Vietnam, a jungle battleground that holds the fate of all Southeast Asia. United States Army Special Forces Team A-726 arrived in Vietnam in the spring of 1964 to set up a base camp and to train an inexperienced South Vietnamese fighting force. This team was commanded by Captain Roger Donlan. Our campsite at Nam Dong was on one of the main infiltration routes cutting from Laos into Vietnam. Uh, we were starting to come, become pretty effective in inter intercepting what might be it, coming down that trail. Two members of Captain Donlan's 12-man team remember those early days. The Vietnamese had what they call the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, CIDG. And these were locally recruited, essentially, farmers that we went in and organized into a military uh, unit to defend their own ground against the Viet Cong. We flew in there, came in there by chopper. Well, I looked down at that dude and <laughs> I said, oh, Lord. I was ready to leave right then. You know, a couple pieces of wire around a perimeter and, and uh, it, it was hairy. But you never know what to expect over there. By the July 4th holiday of 1964, Captain Donlan and the members of his team had only been set up at Camp Nam Dong for six weeks. They were called tension inside their own camp. A fight broke out between a member of their mercenary security force and a South Vietnamese officer. We had an incident in the camp where, as I recall, one of our mercenaries had, uh, after having a beer or two in the, our little thatch hut, we called our beer hall, had commented to one of the Vietnamese officers that he, as a private, uh, was better than the Vietnamese officer. And he, he commented to the fact that he was better because of his ethnic background, and that was confirmed by his pay scale. His pay scale was such that being paid by directly by the Americans. Uh, and we had a pay scale for our, our NUNGs, security force. And it, it happened to be at a higher level than what the Vietnamese government could, could have for their own forces to include their officer corps. And that led to uh, what you might call a shootout. They got into it and they started firing and and uh, we just had this feeling that uh, it was the uh, VC instigated. At least I did. I sat down right away, away and wrote my wife a letter and told her that I felt like uh, we was going to get a hit before the night was over, and, and we did. 
they had never made an all-out attack on a camp up to that point. All, uh, operations would run into firefights or, or uh, get into things, but as far as an all-out attack on the camp, that was the first. Heroes will return in a moment. Return to Heroes. It was 2.30 in the morning on July 6th, 1964, at Special Forces Camp Nam Dong in South Vietnam. When I opened the, our little door going into what was a mess hall, our hut, uh, kind of getting ready to come off the, my rounds of inspection and guard. And when that white phosphorus hit the roof, and literally, blew the roof off, and I think what might have flashed in my mind is that it was a booby trap, or what would a booby trap like that? How would that ever been rigged? And, you know, so it, I didn't dwell on that at all. It was incoming. And uh, then it was just a matter of moments. It, it didn't cease. Ward around came in right by our front door. And uh, of course I got up and just rolled over and put my 38 pistol on and reached and grabbed my rifle and uh, I took off. I was in my drawers, you know. I didn't have any clothes on. I just took off. <laughs> the buildings were all burning, including the infirmary. And Terry and I took the equipment that we had packed up for a camp move that we had scheduled out of the infirmary. If we hadn't, we would have had no medical gear at all. And even as it was, we ran out before the morning was over. During the violent battle that ensued, lasting five hours and resulting in heavy casualties on both sides, Captain Donlin directed the defense operations in the midst of an enemy barrage of mortar shells, falling grenades, and extremely heavy gunfire. One of the horrifying recollections I... Again, I believe it was Brownie, one of our interpreters, doing as he was trained to do, instructed to do, as a, during those cases that he would become not only an interpreter but a member of the fighting team en route to the mortar pit had his both legs blown off. A, he ran on the stubs of his legs until he died uh, going to the mortar pit. That exemplifies the determination. We thought really that we was dead. You know, there's no way, no way we was gonna get out of there alive. Really makes you nervous when every round falls inside the inner perimeter, right in the center of the camp. None fell out in the striker. They had that thing paced off to the to the, the end, last inch. Yeah. They knew exactly where they were shooting. He then dashed through a hail of small arms fire and exploding hand grenades to abort a breach of the main gate. En route to this position, he detected an enemy demolition team of three in the proximity of the main gate and quickly annihilated them. In my mind, it was that immediate use of handheld flares that stole that veil darkness away from the attacking force and unveiled to us the magnitude of the attack when we saw literally, literally scores and scores of attackers that had already penetrated the outer perimeter and were starting to penetrate and come over the bomb wire into the inner perimeter. Uh, robbing them of that uh, and then being able to uh, eliminate every single one that had penetrated the inner perimeter. Uh, or, and then again, scores that were left on the wires, or at least dozens, I don't know, scores. Uh, bodies on the, on the wire. Uh, Kong were using, as I said, our people weren't shooting. The 
Viet Cong were using loudspeakers, trying to get our, our people in the inner perimeter to lay down their weapons and say they didn't want anybody but the Americans. And anger was my greatest emotion at the time. There was no way that I was going to stop as long as I was able to carry on. When they did make that plea, there was a very obvious roll in the fire from the camp, in defense of the camp, and that was horrifying for me as commander, because I think if there was ever a moment that I felt that we might lose, it was that, it was that moment. And it maybe it was, you know how the tide turns I didn't have any idea where they was at. You know, I was just firing out in that general direction. And then Captain Donnellan says he came over and wanted me to fire over Beeson's uh, sector because he thought Beeson was dead. And uh, so I shifted my mortar around to his position. And I just went over all around the camp, all just all morning. Just passed it out there just as far as I could, as fast as I could put them out there. You know, I'd put a an illumination round in and then I'd drop an HE, just keep alternating all morning and, until I wound up, I fired over 500 rounds. Although exposed to the intense grenade attack, Donlin then succeeded in reaching a 60 millimeter mortar position despite sustaining a severe stomach wound as he was within five yards of the gun pit. Noticing that his team sergeant was unable to evacuate the gun pit, he crawled toward him and while dragging the fallen soldier out of the gun pit, an enemy mortar exploded and inflicted a wound in Captain Donlin's left shoulder. Indirect fire came in and landed near the head of the steps of that mortar pit. And the wounds that Sad Alamo already had suffered were compounded to the point there. That, that was the moment he gave his life. And we were blown back into the pit. And I don't know how long I was not physically there. But when I regained consciousness, I, I know that when we fell back, I had that feeling of that falling into an eternal abyss that, that was maybe how you felt as you left this earth. Uh, um, I know that passed fleetingly, whether it was a flash or a moment or what. I regained consciousness, and then the worst moment was to realize that Pop was dead. And I still have a mental picture of that pit. Those steps in the ground were stained by his blood, and that was the most fresh blood that, that stain I remember, but that whole pit had stains of blood and then from all the men that fought in that pit. Despite his critical physical condition, he again crawled 175 meters to an 81 millimeter mortar position and directed firing operations which protected the seriously threatened east sector of the camp. Without hesitation, he left this sheltered position and moved from position to position around the beleaguered perimeter. We had limited fighting positions. It was, and I never crossed my mind, but in retrospect, it was damn foolhardy to get out of a position and, and go. And I think Lieutenant O had stated afterwards it was almost suicidal to go from A to B uh, or try. But it was the only way to communicate, to let, for me to know how my men were and to let them know the overall situation. He, he was on his feet. He said, I'm all right. Go ahead and, and take care of the other folks. And when we get things cooled down, then we'll look at me. And I approached him on three different occasions in my rounds to try to finally get him to, to let me take a look at him. And ultimately just had to tell him to sit down. And that was at daylight. And take his shirt off and let me look at him, see what he had. My wounds I felt were insignificant. I certainly, certainly there was pain. He had actually seven different wounds on his body. Um, one that what really worried me the most was an entry wound right about here, right over the liver. 
And I really thought that was going to kill him. I really did. As the long-awaited daylight brought defeat to the enemy forces and their retreat back to the jungle, leaving behind 54 of their dead, many weapons and grenades, Captain Donlin immediately reorganized his defenses. We made it through the night, and they made their decision that they had made a big enough sacrifice. It turned out to be the largest sacrifice in recorded history to that great time in, in sheer numbers by the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese. Uh, the fact that some 50, 55 bodies were still there the next morning was a measure of the sacrifice that they made. Uh, that was compounded by the fact that we knew that historically they would take all wounded and, and dead from the battlefield, having a horrendous psychological impact on anyone that had been hit by them. To find nothing the next day owing to some rose. Uh, in this case, we found evidence of, and we didn't look at it, is their sacrifice at that time or not. However, really, it was our victory over them. I didn't think the night would ever, would ever end and get daylight, but it finally did. And I had three rounds of ammunition left when, when I was all over. There. Even after I had administered aid, I had to order him on the helicopter. <laughs> I didn't have the legal authority to do it, but I told him he was relieved. He had no more command authority to get on the helicopter. And he finally did it. Captain Donlin was evacuated to an armed forces hospital in Vietnam, where he recovered from his wounds. Two months after the attack, he was back on duty, inspecting a special forces camp in Vietnam. Roger Donlin remembers receiving a gift while he was recuperating, just after the encounter at Nam Dong. General Aubrey S. Newman, retired Major General, inscribed a book that he had written to me and in his words, he said something to the effect that the bravery of the man on Detachment A-726 took what seemingly would have been total defeat and through their collective courage turned it into a victory. Heroes will return in a moment. Return to Heroes. The battle at Camp Nam Dong was part of the escalation of the conflict in Vietnam. And less than one month later, an incident in the Gulf of Tonkin prompted President Lyndon Baines Johnson to commit more U.S. forces to fight a war which soon became our own. Our ships clashed with North Vietnamese ships, and Congress passed a resolution granting the President broad powers to wage war in Vietnam. In the larger sense, this new act of aggression aimed directly at our own forces again brings home to all of us in the United States the importance of the struggle for peace and security in Southeast Asia. Reinforcements are being moved into strategic locations as part of a new strategy in this frustrating war. This is not to force a showdown with the Reds, but to emphasize the U.S. wish to contain the war. Interceptor and fighter-bomber aircraft are being flown into South Vietnam and Thailand rapidly as other air squadrons are transferred from the United States to advanced bases in the Pacific. The United States seeks no wider war. But the United States is determined to use its strength to help those who are defending themselves against terror and aggression. So the U.S. role in Vietnam became fixed, like the mob drawn to the flame. In the fall of 1964, the U.S. government felt it could win the war it would wage. And Roger Donlan would become the first hero of that conflict. He was uncomfortable when first notified that he would receive the Medal of Honor for his heroic defense of Nam Dong. I felt that it was totally out of perspective. I didn't really 
didn't believe it until a phone call came. I was informed that uh, your presence was desired at the White House in the East Room on the 5th of December, 1964. I think I was numb. I saw the metal flash as General Clifton handed it to the President. Saw that blue ribbon. President Johnson chose impromptu remarks, which went far beyond those brief remarks, which were properly uh, sufficient for the occasion. But for some reason or another, he was moved. And when he made reference to me as being an inspiration to all Americans, it it's really hit me that I have been cast into another role and been given more challenges and more responsibilities to be just that. The first hero. Or not, uh, hero. A person admired for courage, nobility, or exploits especially in war. A person admired for qualities or achievements and regarded as an ideal or model. He rose to the occasion. He met the challenge. He inspired us. He is a hero. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.